Hey everybody, Rob Mullins here, and welcome to another jazz piano tutorial. And today I've got a topic that was sent in by request, and uh, thanks for sending it in because this is one of those things where it's so easy to get confused. And uh, what we're talking about is reharmonization techniques. So um, if you, you know, for example, <clears throat> if you've got a fake book chart to a jazz standard and you think those chords are really boring, uh, especially on some of the charts like Bye Bye Blackbird, those charts are awful. Um, you know, and then you go to the Miles Davis version of Bye Bye Blackbird and you go, wow, that's amazing. I think that's Wenton Kelly on there. And uh, who was playing bass? I forget. Putting all these other chord things in there under the melody notes and making the song really cook and sound great harmonically. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And um, specifically, melody note reharmonization. So uh, a couple of things I want to say before, you know, getting all the way, all the way into it. I worked with a bass player back in the 80s in uh, Denver, and his name was Marty Ruddy. And Marty was a dear friend. And also just a fantastic bass player, like ridiculously talented, super good. But the one thing that he didn't know how to do is he didn't know how to read music at all. So there was just this, you know, kind of a disconnect there in certain ways with him because I was used to writing out bass charts for bass players and not used to guys just saying, hey, man, I don't know how to read music, so can you show it to me? And um, we would get together live and try and figure this stuff out. And he'd be sitting there with his bass, and I'm kind of known for doing unusual harmonic moves and you know weird bass notes to chords that sometimes makes sense at first and sometimes only makes sense later. And Marty would sit there with his bass and uh, he had a five string bass. So that low C right there actually was playable by him. His bass went and I'd have some chord structure and he would just start trying everything. It'd be C and go through all the different notes like this. Sometimes before he went through all 12, he'd get frustrated and he would just look at me and he said this key thing that stuck with me all these years, which is, it's got to be on here somewhere. And it is. But it was a trial and error approach, which really cost us a lot of time uh, because of his inability to read at that time. So what I ended up doing is just recording this stuff and putting it on a cassette tape, giving it to him. And he would spend his time, put in his work at home and uh, you know, make that stuff happen on his own time and then come just play his butt off on the recording sessions and, and at the gig, which was always amazing. So anyway, but over the years, I decided it would be a good idea to take my own techniques that I use and share them with people just to give you an idea about how to systematically approach this stuff it's still trial and error in a way but uh thanks to this new app that i got uh cordy which is absolutely fantastic love the cordy guys and i haven't had a chance to read them, I, think, but I, I will one of these days and uh do that because it's a very helpful teaching tool and i i'm now using it all the time so we'll just take a melody note. Let's say you got a standard and we're going to be in the key of C and your first melody note of the tune is this G right here. So, you know, systemizing this chromatic approach and just taking major chords and putting them underneath that melody note, you can use all 12 of the major chords and just see what you come up with as far as a start to reharmonization for that melody note. So here's a C major and a D flat major, a 
T major with a G on top. Now that doesn't sound good to my ear. So on my notepad, I would scratch that out and say, do not use, do not like. E flat, that's very consonant, sonorous, sounds pretty normal. Uh, the E with a plus nine, that's okay. The F major with the add two, everybody loves that one in the world. Let's try the rest of them. And the G over the F sharp major, not my favorite. I would cross that one off. That's fine. G over G. A flat major seven. People like that. I like that. Uh, A seven. That's pretty meat and potatoes. G over a B flat major chord. That's cool. That's B flat six. And not too bad. G major seven sharp five. And then C major as the final one. So right away, you've got 12 options right there for something you could put in as a different chord underneath a melody note, okay? So this is systematic. This is the way I, I do stuff because I'll take a little bit of math. I'll experiment with it. I'll eliminate the things that don't sound good and I'll use the ones that do. All right, going on to the next part of this. Now we're going to do the five chord types. And if you've been watching my tutorial videos, you know that I've gone into detail about the five chord types, 60 chord system, all of that. And here's where it starts to get pretty interesting. So I'm just gonna play these major seven chords first, like this. That one I don't like. This, that's very interesting to me. That sounds pretty cool. Uh, what do the other ones do? I'm on F now, G flat major. Don't like that, wouldn't use that. That's totally fine. That's fine. Eh, nope, not sonorous, not consonant. Doesn't work. That's fine. And then the last couple here, B major. Maybe as a passing chord. That kind of works if you do that backwards. You just, you know, you take bar 29, bar 28, and then bar 27 on the previous page. And you've already got something, right? You already have something you could use. That happened pretty fast. Now notice right here at uh, 14, 15, 16, bar 17, it says times five chord types. So that means with this G melody note, you start with the first chord type, major seven, you get a dominant, you get a minor, minor seven, flat five, distinct, sounds horrible, diminished, also sounds horrible. But there's three of those that are cool. This one's nice, this one's nice, that one's nice. I like all three of those. Okay, now let's go to the next one and try the five chord types in the left hand. So, this is our melody. I like that. Nah, not so much. That's fine. That's totally cool. And if you go all the way through all of these, next one's going to be D major. Uh, let's see what E flat major sounds like. I'm going to skip one here and try it. Uh huh. Dominant seven does not work for that work for that doesn't really work for that okay so you see there's a a trial and an error process in here but the basic idea look at these bass notes okay you're going just like what marty would do actually you're going to start by saying okay c up a half step we're going up the chromatic scale e flat e f F sharp, G, A flat, A, B flat, B, D. And that's kind of a starting point for all this stuff. Now, the way that I got into this, and I have some great influence uh, influencers and, and people, some that I knew personally, to thank for developing my own approach, out of this information and i'd have to say the very first one is george russell and if you don't know who george russell was 
he was the guy that invented this thing called the Linian chromatic concept of tonal organization. And you can imagine when I was in high school and I was messing around with this kind of a thing. And this kind of a thing on my mom's piano that one day I would get to study with George Russell in New York City for a whole summer, the guy who invented the only jazz theory concept of the 20th century. So I'll go, um, I plan on doing more George Russell stuff in future videos, talking about that whole summer in New York. But the thing that resonated with me when I got out there to meet with him is that he was doing the same kind of stuff that I'm showing you right here and he came up in an era where the people around him were the giants of jazz in New York City. <clears throat> so uh, Bill Evans, you could consider Bill's approach uh, largely or partially based on his study of the George Russell concepts, which were these things like chromatic bass lines and reharmonization, as I'm showing it to you here. The Lydian scale being more appropriate for a major chord. Uh, Miles Davis also drew heavily on George Russell, so did John Coltrane. And I got to spend a whole summer with George that was life-changing forever. So in terms of reharmonization, George was the first king, the first influencer. Um, number two is going to be an arranger who did these amazing charts for uh, my band boss that I still work with, and that's the flute player, Hubert Laws. And I've now been in Hubert's group for about 30 years. And the arranger on his early stuff on CTI Records was a guy named Don Sebesky. And Don Sebesky was one of the greatest re-harm guys, re-harmonization dudes, whatever you want to call it, uh, of all time, and especially of that era, because he could keep all of this stuff that we're looking at in his head and just sketch it out onto paper and and come up with ridiculous options that don't make any sense and they sound beautiful and um, in future videos i'm going to share some of his charts that he did for hubert laws because as hubert's keyboard player i happen to have don sebesky's charts they're like sitting right here on the uh, bookshelf. And they're a great form of study for me. So Don Sebesky, Reharm Genius. Um, love everything about him. Number three is going to be Joe Zawinul from Weather Report. And Joe was the first guy that I heard. There was one other guy that used this chord. But he was the first guy that I ever heard play this chord. And, and when I was a kid, we didn't have a name for it. I started doing it. Uh, on my own and I was running this scale on the marimba at my college classes and percussion ensemble at Greeley at UNC and other people would be practicing the parts and I'd be going what is this scale over this chord and why is that D flat or that C sharp sound cool in there What about this chord? Now, with mallets, you can't really do that, but on a piano, you can. And that was a sound that I was just messing around with that sound. I started hearing it on these Weather Report albums when they came out, and I was like, well, the chord that all of us in college are calling the C demolished because it ruins everything about the tonic note with all these dissonances and dissonances in there. We used to call that the C demolished chord. Well, all of a sudden it's on weather report records along with all these other insane uh, things like, you know, this chord right here, the flat nine and a sharp nine on B flat. I was hearing Zawinul doing that and he would just put these crazy synth chords out there and Rhodes chords and playing two different keys at once arpeggiate things in ways that nobody had ever done that. Um, I still am just amazed every time I hear Zawinul play. And for me, what was amusing about him was that he would come up with some 
you know, wacky chord like this. And he was so, and Cordy doesn't even know what that is. You see, it says NC. And I think that stands for no Cordy. <laughs> Does not know how to analyze that. <clears throat> and Zawana would play that and he'd have this deadpan look on his face, throwing this huge amount of dissonance into the sound system. And a look on the, on his face was like, yeah, I did that. What? It's great. I'm Joe Zawano. It's fantastic. So Zawano was another guy that just encouraged me to just try all kinds of, you know, strange things and moves and begin the process of elimination of taking, you know, certain chords away from melody notes and liking other chords under melody notes. And that's really what we're talking about today is chords underneath melody notes. So whatever you're dealing with is your issue chart is boring you can start doing your own uh things underneath so what i'm going to do now um is i'm going to just bring cordy up here a little bit higher so you can see the keyboard a little better and i'm going to go ahead and play a little bit i think what i'll try is uh as an example i think i'll try all the things you are now, the traditional way of doing this uh, jazz standard is it's walking the circle of keys around. Those are the normal chords. And of course, you should master that stuff. You should have some idea of what that is. How does that work? You know, but if you're working with, especially as a keyboard player, if you're working with horn players that really know their stuff, and you want to get, you want to be able to play all of that, but you also want to be able to with a nice arrangement and a chart like Don Sebesky would do for Hubert Laws and just hand it to him and say, hey, what do you think about this? So um, right, I'm going to take a crack at all the things you are and see see how I, I do just kind of winging after all the years that I've been doing this, just going to wing it and see what happens here. to give you kind of a, a general idea and you know if if it took me 40 years to just be able to kind of come up with that and wing it on the spot it might take you 40 minutes you young whippersnappers that are have only 15 seconds to ever study anything that are on tiktok all day but i'm just joking around so that's a basic idea of the mullins melodic reharmonization system and um i want to thank you for your support of the channel it's definitely growing right now and one way you can really help it grow is to paypal donate to the podcast which if you don't know about it i've got a great uh educational podcast going with a lot of people from the grammys winners nominees big time studio people in la and in india and in new york and that's also part of my YouTube channel, which is 
channel you're watching, youtube.com slash Planet Mullins. And um, please subscribe if you can see the button down there in the bottom right. And if you're not logged into YouTube, just throw me a like because that makes other people think that I know what I'm doing. So thanks for joining me. This is uh, Rob Mullins signing out for now. And I'll see you on the next one. Have a beautiful day. Bye-bye.